Hello, my name is Emma Hurd and I'm Executive Director of Emissions and Environment for Westpac Institutional Bank. I'll be talking today about three main areas uh, of environmental issues impacting the financial services sector. Firstly, I'll be talking about some of the, the big mega trends that we're seeing impacting Australia and the Australian economy, uh, including uh, energy consumption and water use and, and some of the broader kind of uh, macro issues which business is looking to respond to. Secondly, I'll be talking briefly around what Westpac is doing and how we've sought to manage this huge complex agenda over the last 10 to 15 years. And lastly, I'll just be talking briefly about some of the lessons that we've learned along the way in terms of how companies and Australian business is responding to the challenge of climate change. Um, so I'm going to pick up on some of the themes that Tim was also talking about, um, but probably take it out to a wider picture as well in terms of talking about how financial institutions are looking at climate change and the response to climate change from a very operational perspective. Like, how do we actually take this massive subject and do something about it as a large corporate, as a large financier, as an investor in long-term long -term assets which are very much impacted by policy uncertainty? And I'm probably also going to take even a bigger picture step than where Tim started from, which is actually to, to, to frame climate change itself against the backdrop of all of the, the, the macro issues that business is kind of dealing with. And um, I'm not going to do the social issues, such as, you know, ageing of the population or so forth. I'm going to keep it focused on environment. But I just want to go through that really quickly, just to give a sense of what some of these long-term signals are that businesses are looking at and trying to respond to and deal with in an incredibly turbulent regulatory environment. And I do talk quite quickly, apparently, so if I'm going too fast, or if the microphone's popping, then please just wave your hand and I'll slow down. Um, I'm conscious of how fast I talk. So, what is the big issue driving all of the other issues? And I think it would be fair to say you can't go past this one. This is in terms of global population growth, you know, projected global population growth. And there's a bit of contention around where that figure is going to top out. But the implications of this are fairly profound. It's profound in terms of our forms and modes of economic production, in terms of the, the industrialization of our society, in terms of our energy consumption, land use, water use, in terms of a whole range of factors which impact how business operates on a very day-to-day -day basis. It also has an impact in terms of how much energy we use, how efficient we are in terms of running our economy and growing our economy or recovering our economy in the last few years. And it also has an impact in terms of other environmental impacts. And protein consumption is a really interesting one because it's often referred to as the wealth effect. In other words, industrialization of emerging economies means growth of the middle class. The wealthier people are, the more meat they eat on a daily basis, which means more agricultural production required. And when you bear in mind that around 70% of all global water consumption goes towards current levels of agricultural production, you begin to see how you can't look at carbon without looking at energy, without looking at water, without looking at land use in a much more integrated way than what, probably what we have traditionally. I also put this up and I'm just picking up on what Tim was saying. We have a 5% reduction target at least. If we're going to avoid two degree warming, science tells us we should have a 25% reduction target at least. And business kind of knows this. They know that regardless of how you get there, somehow we have to actually achieve projected emissions reductions of more than 25, 28%. That's a fairly chunky uh, amount of emissions to remove from the economy on a very short amount of time from an investment perspective. So you've got this almost contradictory situation where you have very clear signals around where we're supposed to be going and extremely short-term and turbulent signals over how we're going to get there, which determines how you respond and how you invest. So for business, this is, this is why so many companies are banging on about the need for regulatory certainty. It's not just code for give us what we want. It's actually tell us how we're going to get there and we'll go forth and do. I think it's also quite interesting in terms of how business thinks about these macro issues. And this is quite an interesting report that's put out by the World Economic Forum, not exactly renowned for being a bunch of hippies when it comes to environmental issues. It's an annual survey of around 1,000 thought leaders and business responders around what they see as the major issues impacting their operating environment in terms of likelihood and impact. And year on year, when I look at this list, what always strikes me is that these are not traditional economic issues. When, they, when they're looking at identifying what are the macro issues which really have the ability to significantly impact their day-to-day -day business and their long-term business, they're all environment, social and governance issues. So how companies are thinking about it, how they're strategically positioning, how they're actually identifying these megatrends as they're often referred to, and how they're responding 
does get fed into the short-termism of um, quarterly profit reporting and um, you know, sort of expense management, those sorts of issues that business does respond to. So how do you take that huge picture and actually distill it down into something that you can do as a company in, as I mentioned, the quite limited parameters of the day-to-day -day operating environment of a large corporate subject to the scrutiny of the market on how you're managing expenses how you're delivering profits, how you're actually keeping your employees happy, how you're growing your business and responding to these sorts of changed market conditions. So I'm going to, given the, um, you know, obviously I could just talk for the entire day about this, <laughs> but so what I'm going to try and do is just frame it around the environmental dimension, give you a very brief history around how Westpac kind of got from the macro to the, the micro positioning on climate change issues, and just talk through three main areas where we think as a company and as a financial institution we can have an impact in terms of climate change. And then just at the very end, talk about some of the lessons learned along the way. So this is my 12 years in one slide, slide, um, which I'm pretty happy about from a PowerPoint perspective. Um, <laughs> although, of course, it's quite hard to read, so I'll talk through it just a little bit. So, I mean, in terms of how companies think about these huge macro issues, one of the more useful ways that companies in, in the last, say, 15, 20 years have found um, to, to put a framework around, to put their hands around these huge intangible issues is the emergence of the whole sphere or the whole world of sustainability. And you notice that like both Tim and I have, have got sustainability and climate change in our job titles and that's because you can't look at one without looking at the other. But it's also about how you take the issue and operationalise it, put a, put a management framework around it in a lot of ways. So but this is kind of the journey that Westpac's taken over the last 12 years, moving through the various stages of how do you actually operationalise it, you know, recognising it as an issue, putting in place the internal governance frameworks, um, all, the, all the critical stuff that you need, such as a board committee to, to make sure people are doing it, um, you know, measurement and reporting frameworks, auditing, you can't do anything. Well, you, auditing always improves everything, I think it would be fair to say. How, then moving it into your actual core business model. How do you then expand it out beyond just your property management? How do you make it part of your supply chain management, your customer engagement across the whole value chain? And then moving it into how do we use this as a means of competitively positioning our company within our sector to deliver additional value to our employees, our stakeholders and our shareholders against the backdrop of these wider issues that we're strategically responding to. So I mean, Sustainability is often called many things, but in my mind it's actually the tool that business uses to take these huge massive issues and, and chunk it down into something which you can do something about, that you can understand for your business, that you can respond to, that you can actually implement a traditional kind of business response to. And of course over the last few years there's no doubt that climate change and, and the, the need to have certainty around the policy frameworks for climate change in Australia but also in other jurisdictions where we operate has been one of the major drivers of a whole range of environmental policy initiatives. I would say to some extent it's almost consumed all of the other environmental issues that we need to be responding to. And I say that in the context of water policy for example. Such a massive issue for the world, so many social ramifications and economic ramifications, and yet it hasn't had anywhere near the same kind of focus and scrutiny as the issue around climate change, which I think is kind of interesting over the last five years, particularly in Australian policy development. So how do we deal with climate change as a, as a large corporate? And just to put it in context, before I get to our actual financing activities, you have to remember that we're one of the largest corporations in Australia. We have around 40,000 employees. We have something like 1,500 branches and, and office buildings. Um, we have 12.2 million customers. So we have a big footprint. So what we do as a company, how we manage ourselves as a procurer, actually does have an influence um, across the behaviour of the Australian economy. So being a bank, what do we do? We put in place policy and process. If there's one thing we love, it's a good policy that we can audit ourselves against. Um, this is kind of the, the rough sort of framework that we've implemented. I won't go through every dot point because it's obviously um, quite detailed. But just to give you an indication, I think what's interesting on the policy and procedure is that we've kind of moved, every time we've refreshed or, or reintroduced an environmental policy, we've increased the level of sophistication of our actual response. And we've actually then ended up separating some of them out to deal with different issues in different ways. So originally the environment policy included direct and indirect impact. So our electricity consumption, but then also our lending and finance. Now we have different policies for each of those dimensions because the response is too, too big, basically. 
I think we've also seen the, the tangential kind of, you know, um, rise of, of uh, independent and consistent reporting frameworks that everybody uses in order to make sure that you can benchmark performance within industry sectors and between industry sectors, which I think is an incredibly important um, emerging development, or yeah, still emerging development. I think also we've kind of recognised that we have like 13,000 suppliers, so we can actually make a difference in terms of our purchasing behaviour as well, just by having minimum environmental standards. So this, this is almost like the first phase of a corporate response to climate change. These are the things that you should have to some degree of, um, of, of sophistication. And I think definitely what we've seen over the last five years is that there's, there's not very many companies that wouldn't have some form of this running across their operations, and that some of these have subsequently been picked up and put into compliance, compliance reporting frameworks. So this is not, I would not say that this is leadership anymore, although it was 10 years ago. Obviously, where do we have our biggest impact? It's in terms of what we do every day. You know, financial institutions have an incredibly unique perspective on the issue of climate change. We sit in the middle of the economy and society. We lend to or invest in every single industry sector at every level in terms of size, whether it's large uh, energy generation assets or, you know, 15 grand to, to, to buy a car. You know, so in terms of our ability to, 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 to influence or to intervene across the economy or to have an impact, it's, it's massive. On the other hand, I think it would be fair to say nobody wants their bank telling them how they're supposed to be spending their money. So it's an incredibly difficult line that we walk in terms of trying to be a positive influence, but also recognising that everybody has a different definition of what being a positive influence actually means. So how do we, how do we balance that almost seemingly impossible task it's on certain days, I can tell you? We do it through pricing risk. We do it through our risk management assessment processes. We actually make the argument that environment risk impacts financial returns, therefore how you manage it matters. Uh, and we put all the same sorts of rigour around assessing that as we do as every other form of financial risk. And it does actually make a difference in terms of the kinds of investment decisions that you make. This is our risk management framework. This is our, essentially how we assess risk. This is from our credit policy. It's a straight cut and paste. It, and basically, and it demonstrates where we integrate environment, social and governance risk at every stage of the loan, origination and approval, evaluation, documentation and then refinancing process, which is why it goes all the way around. And just to pick up on what Tim said, when you want to talk about the impact of uncertainty, when you have a long-term signal, such as bipartisan support for a 5% emission reduction target by 2020, but you don't have certainty around how you're going to achieve it, in how we manage the risk, which kind of reinforces Tim's point, is that we will price the risk of the downside, but we can't price in the risk of the upside or the lack of risk of the upside. So there, it's, it's, a, it's a more, uncertainty creates a more punitive approach to financing, it's fair to say. When you have resolution around how it's going to be achieved, you can more accurately assess to a more micro level how different companies are actually managing that risk, and you, you're, you're in a position to actually more proactively uh, reward through how you price the risk the companies that are managing it more effectively. So, sort of like a complicated factor, but that when we talk about the, the cost that uncertainty adds, that's why, that's why it happens. Um, I think, and the, probably the, the third point where we actually try and um, proactively respond to climate change issues is in terms of looking at what our customers are doing and what they need from us as a financial institution to continue to do that. And so we're continually looking at our own products and services and lending activities to evaluate where something new is required or um, more often than not, and that's why I say we're required, is because more often than not what we find is that it's actually not so much the design of new financial instruments or new products and services. It's actually the application of existing forms of finance and products and services to new activities or to activities undertaken for new reasons or over different time frames. And to give you an example, we don't need to create a whole new bespoke working capital um, solution for someone who wants to replace their capital stock two years earlier because energy pricing now makes it more economic for them to, to buy new equipment than to keep running the old equipment and not spend the money to, to upgrade. So that doesn't require a whole new product for us necessarily. But then in other cases, we kind of recognise that the market's changing, and I think solar is a fantastic example of that. Like every government, state and federal, has consistently underestimated household appetite for solar. Um, both in terms of the policy settings, the costings of those policy settings, but also in terms of underestimating the actual, the, the, the sheer appetite. People want panels on the roofs and they're prepared to do that. And then the flow on impacts of that in terms of cost of technology. Um, 
Similarly, in the middle, energy efficiency technically reduces your carbon emissions, but you do it anyway. So if you're managing uncertainty, you don't, it doesn't matter whether or not the coalition wins the election and repeals the carbon price. Electricity prices are still going up. You still need to reduce your energy consumption. It just becomes a question of when or how much you invest um, and what the financial benefits are for you, which kind of reinforces my point around looking at the macro picture, understanding the underlying trends driving corporate behaviour. And it might, some of it might be for climate change, but more often than not, it's the composite of the whole picture that changes actual corporate behaviour. And I guess the last one is, is the emergence of carbon trading as a whole new financial market. And I think this is a really interesting one, and probably there's so much focus in Australia around um, the politics of it. But there's probably not enough scrutiny or understanding around the actual market dynamics of it. It's a really interesting market because it's so driven by regulatory decisions. And um, I guess the, uh, the, the banking equivalent of the chart around the impact of policy uncertainty on the, on the cost of technology would be looking at um, the carbon price and the carbon market. And we often use a chart of the first two years of operation of the New Zealand Emissions Trading Scheme, and then we overlay it with government announcements of regulatory decisions, and then we overlay that with the corporate response. And what you see is the price doing this as governments make announcements to change, make short-term decisions around policy settings, and then corporates respond. And it's, it's kind of, it, it's sort of like the best and the worst of a, of a, of a regulatory-driven market in the sense that it achieves what it's intended to, but at the expense, in, in a lot of cases, of, of how corporates are trying to manage their risk over a longer period of time. So back to the sustainability component, obviously you need to recognise that climate change is not the only thing that companies are responding to, and we've just been through a very gruesome two-year process of resetting our entire sustainability agenda, where we threw everything back on the table and then looked at what are the real issues that have the ability to impact our operations and that we have an ability to impact on, and came up with, um, in classic banking fashion, three key themes supported by 10 specific objectives with quarterly reporting KPIs. Um, which, <laughs> but just to keep it relatively high level, these are the, the, the three main areas where we're focusing over the next five years to 2017. And I, we, we use the date 2017 because that's the year when Westpac actually turns 200 years old. So mo all of our core business strategy at the moment is focused on that 2017 date in terms of what kind of a company we want to look like on our 200th birthday. In terms of the environment um, objective or environment stream there, what you'll notice is that we've deliberately taken the step to acknowledge the broader environmental issues and, and also trying to explicitly say that our role is to look at how um, economic solutions can be those points of intervention to achieve environmental outcomes. Our role as a financier is so critical in that regard. And what are we actually doing? I mean, this is obviously quite hard to read in the old Westpac grey, but if you look at the, the middle bit, the three specific objectives that we are doing over the next five years, and I'll, I'll start with number six. Um, and for some reason number five seems to have disappeared, but anyway. In terms of number six, what we're actually doing is two things. One, we're going to go carbon neutral for the next five years, but also, secondly, we're, um, we're changing the way we do our environmental reporting. And to give you an indication of how that works when you change the emphasis, previously we had a top-line um, target of reducing emissions by, say, 20%. But that doesn't encounter some of the other Im environmental impacts you have from a resource consumption perspective. And to give you an example, we are massive consumers of paper. Paper is only 2% of our total emissions. So if we, have a, 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 you know, if we were actually targeting emissions reductions, we would be spending nothing in terms of priorities on reducing paper consumption. So when you actually sort of take it out from just that carbon lens and you look at the full range of environmental impacts that we have, you end up with slightly different targets and slightly different focus. We've also kind of disaggregated it to make it more meaningful. So energy consumption targets are split between data centres and our commercial property portfolio, which we hadn't done previously. Um, and we've also got water consumption reduction targets as well in there. Even though we're not massive water consumers, we're trying to make the point that the full range of environmental issues is where you actually have your, your full footprint. The other, two, the other two targets are probably the more influential. The first one, number four, the products and services to help our customers respond to these environmental challenges. In reality, what we're aiming for there is to develop and launch one product per year for the next five years, particularly targeting our retail business. So our retail business includes Westpac St George, uh, Rams, Bank SA, Bank of Melbourne, and BT Financial Group, which are all Westpac. Um, and essentially what we're targeting for this year is energy efficiency for, for small business and for not-for-profits. And that's very much that, that sort of relationship between um, bottom line and environmental bottom line benefits and impacts. 
Um, so we'll be doing quite a lot over the next six months on that one. The other one, the one in the middle, the big chunky one that got some headlines was making six billion in lending and investment available for clean tech and environmental services by 2017. So what does that mean specifically? We're not setting up a big fund. We're not going into competition with the Clean Energy Finance Corporation or ARENA. Essentially, what we're, what we're doing is we're saying that our current total aggregated exposure is around three billion. We want to double it by 2017. We want to double our exposure to what we believe is a significant new emerging industry sector in the Australian economy. We want to be banking the companies that are delivering the solutions to the rest of the economy in responding to the economic impacts of these sorts of environmental issues. That's what we're really trying to do with having that very public target out there uh, in terms of a dollar figure pledge to grow the sector. So I think that kind of ties together where we came from in terms of the sustainability, like how do we how do we start with our own operations? How do we build it into our brand? How do we build it into our business? How do we make it real for our financial bottom line? That 12 years in one slide that I put up previously, I think this is a really um, interesting outcome of exactly that change in thinking. So, last slide. What have we learned along the way? One, it's really hard, although I didn't put that on that slide. Um, sec secondly, I think it would be fair to say that if you're working in a company and you're working on climate change issues, you have to have a laser-like focus on understanding precisely why you're doing what you're doing. There are so many things you could be doing around the agenda of just climate change, and that's without even looking at water or biodiversity or land use management or oceans or any other of the equally valuable environmental impacts. But you have to understand what are the biggest impacts on your own organisation and then where are you able to have the biggest impact through your organisation? And you need to keep everything tightly contained within that framework, otherwise you're not actually going to achieve anything. You're just going to um, go grey very quickly, basically. I think the other the second point that we've realised is that you can't look at environmental issues in isolation. You have to understand they all overlap. You can't deal with energy security without dealing with emissions. You can't deal with emissions without dealing with the economic impacts of investment in the energy sector. You actually have to have a some form of balanced approach which looks at all of these concurrently. The other point, the third point that I would make is that we're no longer at the point for corporates operating in this space and sustainability and environmental performance where, you know, business as usual is in any way, shape or form leadership or outperformance. Having a compliance based approach to environmental management is not leadership. You're not leading in your industry sector if you comply with ENGERS, for example. And that, whereas definitely that used to be the case a relatively short period of time ago, I would even say five years ago. Uh, the last one I would say is that unless you're actually translating these risks into opportunities and really making it real for your business, um, then you're not, you're not going to have a, a, a sustainable response to these sorts of issues, particularly in the current economic environment. And the, the part of that is very much um, the philosophy that, that we've always had, that you can't have some you know, huge separate you know, crack team of sustainability professionals. You actually have to be doing the really long, hard slog pushing it through your normal business, which is a lot harder and, and, and a lot more challenging, but is actually the only way you're going to affect real change. And I think I'll leave it there with my disclaimer, <laughs> just in case you believed anything I said, um, and wait for the questions at the end. Thanks very much.